Excellent. Distingués invités, uh, mesdames et messieurs, bonjour et bienvenue à ce webinaire, le troisième d'une série uh, qui se tient depuis quelques temps et organisé par la F. Journalism Network. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning to James and good evening to some of you and welcome to today's webinar, the third in a series of four focused on investigating wildlife and environmental crime in East Africa. I am told that we could uh, do this webinar both in English and in French, and that all the participants, our friends from Rwanda, are comfortable in any of the languages. So I'm going to probably ditch one of my scripts and just use one of them, but keeping in mind that this is organized both in French and in English, and please feel comfortable to use whatever language that you might want to use. On behalf of Internews, the F Journalism Network, the Wildlife and Conservation Media Coverage Project, I would like to welcome all of you very warmly. Today's webinar brings together Rwandan journalists with the overarching objective of learning together, but most importantly, sharing some very critical tips and guidance on how to source local and global stories related to wildlife and environmental crime. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen of the press, the Wildlife and Conservation Media Project housed in Internews East Africa has assembled a great panel for this purpose. With your permission, allow me to introduce right away Mr. James Fine, Director or Executive Director of the F Journalism Network, EJN. Mr. Greg Bakunzi of the Red Rocks Initiative for Sustainable Development. And for those of you who do not know what that is, it is an NGO working on in the Virunga area on protecting some of the most endangered species in that very critical ecosystem. We have Ms. Mark Lenganger, editor of Info Congo, one of the pioneer interactive mapping projects of the F Journalism Network, focused on the Congo Basin. We also have Mr. Samuel Baka Bianci, who is the co-founder of M28 of M28 Investigates. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear participants and dear panelists, today's webinar is both in English and in French, as I indicated earlier on. It will last not more than two hours, and the panel would present for close to 45 minutes. The rest of the time will be used for some robust exchange to enable the reporters present here to draw tips and resources to identify stories on wildlife and environmental crime successfully. But before I do that, allow me to also uh, introduce uh, the folks who are the brains behind this uh, webinar. That's Mr. Kindu Wawuri, one of the project managers at EGEN in East Africa. There is also Mr. Benon Oluka, he's an investigative editor. They are just, uh, they are all fighting this afternoon and we'll be able to jump in anytime in case uh, we do have any important housekeeping issues or other very important issues that might be, or that we might require, uh, that we might be required to know. With all of that locked in, ladies and gentlemen, allow me now, with your permission, to invite Mr. James Fine. Executive Director of the F Journalism Network to speak for about 10 minutes on what the EGN is all about. That's the F Journalism Network. Once again, thank you so much, James, for participating. If you can hear me, good morning to you. And you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you so much, James. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to be with you on this webinar and to uh, well, I won't have a chance to meet all you journalists this time from Rwanda, but uh, it's nice to be able to talk to you. And I do hope someday when this pandemic is over, we'll all be able to meet in person and we can learn uh, even more from each other. So uh, thanks very much to Kiundu and Benon and David for organizing this webinar. Um, I'm going to be trying to be quick and, and speak for about 10 minutes just to introduce you to the uh, Earth Journalism Network and what we do here. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Can you guys all see my PowerPoint presentation now? We can see it, James. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so yes, uh, um, 
the Earth Journalism Network is a global community of now, I believe, over 13,000 journalists from more than 180 countries around the world um, who are dedicated to improving coverage of environment and climate and now health issues very much. Uh, and uh, we do that, uh, especially in low and middle income countries and, and try to focus uh, on providing information to marginalized communities and others who may not have access to all the, the information about these important topics that they need. So uh, just to emphasize through this map that we really are a global network uh, we're also a, a project of Internews. You may have heard of Internews. It's a global media development organization, and that, that is how we implement our activities and projects. Uh, um, we, we get a lot of support from Internews' office, particularly for this project uh, on, on East Africa wildlife journalism. Uh, we have a, a very capable staff based in Nairobi, uh, as well as other countries. Uh, who are helping to manage this project. Uh, but as you can see, we, uh, we really are a global community and it's great to have, uh, of course, this, this participation from Rwanda. Um, what are our activities and topics? So uh, I, I, I'd say our main topics that we report on are climate change, uh, the ocean, biodiversity and wildlife and conservation, of course, forests, food and agriculture, environmental health, uh, really uh, broad based in terms of topics and also in terms of format. We work with journalists who work in all different uh, media and print, TV, radio, online, data journalism. And we have a wide range of activities that we support. So a lot of training and, and journalism workshops like this one. Of course, now we are almost entirely online because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but in in you know we do uh, have a lot of in-person workshops during normal times as well. Um, we give out story grants uh, for journalists. Some of you may have applied recently for the investigative stories. We were all, we offer uh, you know uh, small amounts of money. For, for, for individual journalists to, to produce stories. Um, and we actually have another call open right now. If you're interested in reporting on biodiversity, you can go to the earthjournalism.net website, which is, you see the link on your chat. And there's a call for applications for stories about biodiversity. Uh, you can read a lot more details there. And we're, we're offering, I believe, uh, at least a thousand dollars for for journalists to do their stories. Uh, we also give out grants to organizations uh, as part of this East Africa Wildlife Journalism Project. We've given grants to Water Journalists for Africa, based uh, which focuses on the Nile Basin, and also to the Environmental Journalists Association of Tanzania. Um, and uh, again, we'll be offering more media grants for biodiversity uh, and, uh, and next year. Uh, we support a, a range of regional environmental news platforms. David already mentioned Info Congo. Uh, you should definitely check out Info Congo. And uh, we, there are other sites that we support like Info Nile and Oxpeckers in Southern Africa. Uh, we have sites, many sites in Asia as well and Latin America. Um, so uh, these, these are great resources for you to learn more about what is happening regarding environment, conservation, climate change in your part of the world. Um, we give out fellowships. So um, of course these days are not many major conferences, but we support journalists to attend the major environmental summits like the UNFCCC climate change uh, COP. I know David Akana has been to, for instance, the Rio Plus 12 summit uh, uh, next year. We're expecting many big summits that have all been delayed from this year. We have the uh, Climate COP26 that will be take place in, in, in Scotland. We have the Biodiversity Summit, uh, UN con con uh, 
Convention on Biological Diversity that will be held in China. And the UN Ocean Summit is going to be held in Lisbon in Portugal. Um, and it's still, it will be possible next year to apply for a fellowship to cover the Climate Summit and the Biodiversity Summit. And we've already chosen fellows for the Ocean Summit. Uh, so again, keep a lookout on the earthjournalism.net website for that. And also you're welcome to join our Facebook page, our Twitter feed. We have a Google group, uh, EJNet, that if you wanna get your information via email, uh, you can sign up for that if you haven't already. And finally, I'll mention we also support a lot of investigative reports, special projects. And, and again, we just uh, received uh, several applications from each Africa, uh, over 60 applications, I believe, from East Africa for investigative reports about wildlife and conservation. And those grants are now being awarded. Um, we work with a lot of different partner organizations. Uh, not, I don't believe, we work, we've worked with any in Rwanda, but if, if uh, you know, if anyone is setting up a Rwandan network of environmental journalists, for instance, that is the kind of organization we would love to work with. We do offer again these grants uh, to uh, partner organizations, and uh, we we want to very much encourage journalists within uh, countries to get together. For all those journalists interested in the environment, get together and work together to improve coverage because there really is strength in numbers. I was a journalist for 15 years based in Thailand and I saw firsthand just how helpful it could be if journalists work together to help get help get information about the environment. It can be very difficult to access it and to learn from each other, just as we are doing today. Uh, you can see here. Some of the numbers we, uh, we've trained, actually these numbers are a bit old. We've now trained over 11,000 journalists around the world on environmental issues. We've produced well over 12,000 stories and we try and keep track of the impacts we have too. So for instance, in Tanzania, one of uh, an EGN journalist uh, did a story on a gold mining project that was releasing too much pollution. And as a result of that, uh, the government stepped in and shut down uh, some of the activities of the gold mine. And we're always interested in learning more about these impacts. So if there are impacts from the journalism work you're doing uh, when, as it relates to environment, whether it's change in policy or, or public debate or something, uh, please let us know. We're always interested to hear about that. Uh, I'm, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll try and be quick, but just a brief word about the project supporting this webinar, uh, the East Africa Wildlife Journalism Project. We have focus on conservation, especially on wildlife trafficking, a very big and, and difficult issue to cover on the human wildlife interface. Of course, there are conflicts between wildlife and humans and we need to report on that and help, and help communities find solutions that uh, both uh, protect livelihoods and in agriculture and farms, but also protect the animals. And there are ways to do that. And you as journalists play a very big role in helping to share those solutions. Uh, in addition to this round table, we did have an in-person workshop last year when that was still possible. Uh, and we hope to have them again. Uh, we I mentioned the story grants and investigative journalism we're doing. We are active in, in four countries in addition to Rwanda, that's Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. Uh, this, the, the funding for this project comes from the US government, from US Agency for International Development and the Department of Interior. It's always important to know where money is coming from. And, uh, and we do have a, a, a bigger history in East Africa, Internews and the Earth Journalism Network. We've done other fellowships, grants, workshops. I won't go into them now for the sake of time. But just wanted to say thank you again to everyone for joining. Uh, if you have questions for me, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, sorry, not the chat, in the Q&A feature you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Click on that and, and feel free to ask questions there. Um, I will try my best to write some answers. I will only be on for the first hour of this round table. Unfortunately, I do have to move on, but uh, I know you're in good hands with my colleagues here.
So thanks again for your attention and I'll turn it back over to David. Great, thank you so much, James. Uh, deeply appreciate it. Uh, so keep in mind, uh, dear friends, uh, journalists, that we organize this in part because we want to share resources with you. And so James has actually made quite a good number of call to actions there. Do not forget to check the EGN website. I think that's important. You're going to find that it's incredibly resourceful, it might be very helpful to you. Uh, check the Info Congo website, check uh, Info Nile, our speakers uh, for South, uh, Southern Africa. Uh, all of these are very critical resources, and I bet that if you look at them, uh, you would obviously uh, want to go back because you need those resources, particularly if you're thinking of doing cross-border projects. Um, I'm also being asked to uh, just sort of uh, remind you that it would be important if you have any questions to use the Q&A function, drop your questions right there. And in the meantime, because James has to go, I think it might be important for us to just accommodate a little bit, uh, adjust a little bit and say, uh, let's spend a few minutes. If you do have any questions for James, let's take that before we can move on, if you do not mind. And for those of you who are just joining us, we just have started. We have two hours. I think we've used 17 minutes already. Uh, the next uh, one hour and 40 minutes will be spent on listening to two journalists in the region. They'll be speaking to the experience. One who manages, uh, of course, uh, the M28 investigate, and another who is the editor of Info Congo. And then we're going to hear from uh, someone who is working with an NGO, uh, particularly in the Virunga area. And in the meantime, that uh, uh, offers me an opportunity to double check. It's Mr. Bakunzi on, on the call at this moment. If you are, please just do indicate. You'll be speaking in the third position. So with that, any questions, uh, uh, any comments? Um, I double check to see if there are any questions for James. I do see a few here. Uh, pretty much a comment. Uh, so one is from Amable. Uh, we are a local organization. I suspect you didn't finish your comment, Amable, but please feel free to finish that. Uh, but there is one here from uh, Daniel uh, Sabati. Uh, Daniel is saying hello and thanks, Ijen. Uh, this is Daniel uh, Sabati from KT Press. Uh, James, how do you plan on working with the Rwanda Network for Environmental Journalists? That's a good question for you, James. And to all the speakers, how should media uh, report on environmental threats where communities now have to survive in the midst of the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, threatening to reverse those gains made uh, in countries like Rwanda. So those are good questions. James, you might take the first. Uh, the second is a little bit to all the other speakers. Uh, but if you do want to provide your thoughts on that as well, I think this is important because James has a global perspective and has also held webinars with uh, other regions where they are actually speaking how you, you, you factor in uh, the zoonotics and COVID-19 uh, particularly. So if you might want to bring in some thoughts here before we proceed, that would be great. Over to you, James. Thank you, uh, David. And thank you, Daniel, for your questions. Um, so uh, how would we work with the Rwanda Network for Environmental Journalists? First of all, is there uh, a Rwanda Network of Environmental Journalists? If that is already existing, that would be good to know. Maybe just let me know in the chat if that already exists. Uh, we don't have any resources available, particularly uh, any, any money available right now, but next year we'll be offering, for instance, biodiversity media grants. You do have to apply for that. Uh, funding can be typically between $10,000 and $20,000. Uh, so you need to write a good application, but you're definitely welcome if there is this network, you would be welcome to apply for that and explain what are the activities that you would do. Would you do workshops, story campaigns? Uh, you know, um, we, we are open to new and innovative ideas as well. Um, so, and, uh, and then, you know, for this, the, right now, this East Africa Wildlife Journalism Project is scheduled to end uh, in mid 2021, middle of next year, but we are hoping to get new funding and continue it in the following years. And if that is the case, and then again, we'll have more money for grant to, to support organizations like the Rwanda Network. You do need to apply for the funds. You need to think about what it is you would do with it, do with it and how you would spend it wisely, but we're also happy to talk to you. And then we have a lot of resources, for instance, on our website or 
you know, if you if you need questions, if you have questions, you can engage with us. Uh, we, you know, we'll try, we'll be offering more, we plan to offer more training activities as well. So uh, yeah, so basically grants and training, those are the main things we try to offer partner organizations. Uh, and just to your other question, it is a very big, very difficult issue. It's a good question. A lot of conservation areas are really facing a crisis under the pandemic. Uh, they have relied on tourism, many of them, for 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 finances and and to support jobs. It's it's a big problem all around the world, and I'm sure in Rwanda too. Um, we actually did a webinar about this. Uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to put a link to that webinar in the chat because. We talked with uh, leaders of conservation areas in Mozambique and, and in Belize in Central America and in Malaysia in Asia. And these are all conservation areas that have come up with different strategies for finding other ways to generate income for their areas, whether it's maybe selling some, some products that they're able to generate like crafts or, or doing other activities. But uh, I, if you're interested in this issue, Daniel and others, I suggest I suggest you look at this webinar. It's only an hour long, and I will again put the link to a recording of that webinar in the chat. Great, thank you so much, James. And uh, Daniel has actually shared the link to uh, the website as well as their Twitter account. So thank you so much for doing that, Daniel. It'll be important that we are all familiar with the fact that there is a network on the ground. But in the meantime, there's also Daniel, uh, rather, uh, Daniel uh, uh, Zoha uh, Boni Manana. Uh, apologies if I uh, do not uh, pronounce that correctly. He's trying to check what is the process uh, for setting up, you know, an environmental uh, network, uh, journalism network in, in a country like Rwanda. Uh, so as much as there is one, but Daniel is not a member and he wants to know how you do that. But why don't you just take the question alongside with uh, that of Jean-Claude Manzi? who is asking James, how do you, uh, you've done all these workshops, when do you plan to do one for, for Rwanda? I mean, in the meantime, we should say that we are doing one right away, isn't it? It's not physical, but uh, this is for Rwanda and Germany. So over to you, James, for answers to, to those questions. Yes, well, you know, everything has been made more difficult by the pandemic, of course. Uh, we were hoping to hold round tables in East African countries uh, in person, that obviously has not happened. Uh, I mean, if if we can get new funding from our donor from uh, U.S. Agency for International Developments, then I think uh, you know uh, we would discuss with the project organizers like Kiundu if we should try and hold workshops within East, you know, each East African country, perhaps one in Rwanda. So I can't promise right now. Uh, I do know. Next year, there's going to be a major summit in Kigali. Is that not right? There's some kind of environmental summit. Uh, is it? Uh, it's going to take place. It's the um, maybe it's the International uh, Conservation Biology. Uh, uh, I think there's going to be conservation biologists from all over the world who are planning to attend a conference in Rwanda. Someone please. Let me know if they can confirm that. I, um, but uh, if that is the case, that is a great opportunity for all of you in Rwanda to get lots of good information about wildlife and conservation. Good. Well, thank you so much, James. Uh, that, that's important to know. There is another question for you, James. I think you shouldn't go away yet. I know that you have other things to handle. Um, there is uh, Jean-Claude who works with the Rwandan Broadcasting Agency in Kigali and he's asking to know directly from you, James, if you can support coverage, uh, I mean, on the ground in Kigali and in Rwanda, because he's saying uh, he's interested in covering certain issues that may not necessarily be of interest to his newsroom and uh, can he get support in that direction? So I don't know what your thoughts would be. Uh, we can support, do offer very limited support for coverage from Rwanda. As I mentioned, if if you have a biodiversity story that uh, you want to cover and you need some funds for it, again, look on the earthjournalism.net website. I can try and provide a link, but 
We are offering grants to individual journalists right now for stories about biodiversity. You have to submit an application, explain to us what it is, what is the story you want to do, why it's important, why you are the right person to do it, and and we will review it. And and if it's a good, you know, and now I have to tell you, I have to be honest here, we get a lot of applications. We'll probably get maybe a hundred applications and we can only give out money for, you know, maybe five to 10 stories. So it's it's difficult for us. We cannot support everyone we like. I wish we could support all of you to do a lot more stories, but but you should certainly apply. And I think it's a it, it is a good opportunity for you. And there will be more such opportunities. So if you don't get the grant the first time, you know, don't give up. Keep applying. And I and EJN, let me say, is not the only one supporting these stories. Uh we know the there's now a rainforest investigation network that's being set up. Uh, our friend and colleague Gustavo Faleros, based in Brazil, is now the, is managing this this network. It's a brand new opportunity, and they're going to be, I believe, I don't know all the details, but I think they're going to be looking for investigative journalists in in rainforest areas, and which I assume includes Central Africa. Um, so we are not the only one offering this this coverage. So if you have a good idea for stories. You need support for coverage. Definitely look at the earthjournalism.network website, apply for these opportunities and look at other opportunities too. Thank you, James. So this has been a very useful three, uh, half, half an hour. Uh, we have 90 more minutes to go. Um, I do see that journalists have plenty of interest in the EGN. Uh, and I think you should, because uh, there is plenty uh, there for you to uh, tap from to be able to grow. Uh, there is a whole section of resources on that website uh, that uh, could be useful to you guys. So please feel free to look at that. With your permission, I'd like us to move forward because there are two distinguished panelists here who are going to speak to their experience and help you, uh, of course, this is an exchange, uh, provide some tips as well as guidance on how we can source some of the stories both in Rwanda and because this is mostly transboundary in nature, wildlife issues are transboundary in nature, it would be important that we can also hear how you can work or get teach that can help you work across borders. Uh, in the meantime, may I acknowledge the presence of Mr. Greg uh, Bakunzi. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Uh, last minute that you uh, have been able to connect, so thank you so much. Uh, you would be speaking uh, pretty soon. Uh, we have two more speakers before you, and soon after that, you would be speaking. In the meantime, I encourage you to continue to send in any uh, uh, comments, questions on the Q&A button. Uh, we will take that at some point. So with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to go back to Kigali. Uh, we will be talking to Samuel uh, Baker Bianci. He is a co-founder of M28 Investigate. It's interesting because uh, Samuel has decided to uh, sort of look at how journalists or the role of investigative journalists in rebuilding an, a Rwandan identity, uh, but most importantly, he's also going to be providing us uh, some very useful tips on how we investigate uh, wildlife uh, and environmental crimes in, in his country. Uh, Samuel, you are connected. Once again, good afternoon. Thank you for joining and thank you for accepting to speak to us. Let's take 10 minutes, if that's okay with you, and then uh, we should prioritize the discussion. Over to you. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon to my colleagues, uh, journalists from Rwanda. And uh, thank you very much for organizing such a wonderful webinar, which I think it will be uh, useful to my colleagues uh, from Rwanda. Uh, May I just interrupt you a little bit? Samuel? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, that's better. That's better now. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. I just was not high okay. enough. Thank you. It's okay. I was like, um, uh, I guess this webinar will be helpful to my colleagues, uh, actually, who we work together on a daily basis in Rwanda. And uh, as uh, what I, I wanted to talk to is like uh, the, the role uh, of uh, investigative journalism in our community and how we can actually help uh, in building our identity as a, a nation uh, and even generally play our right role, what actually we need in the, what the society expects from us. 
uh, first of all, uh, we, uh, we'll first talk about the environmental journalism in general, how someone can, uh, and, uh, the tools and tips, uh, all resources on how personally I can go for, like uh, uh, an investigative story in the environmental side and uh, uh, wildlife, uh, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, I consider much. I consider much uh, uh, my entire viewing techniques. Uh, I think uh, one of the ways to get enough information and even uh, credible information is how you ask, uh, how you develop your skills of interviewing and uh, asking the right questions at the right time. Uh, at a certain point, helps uh, me as a journalist to have what I need because before I go to do a story, I, I make a lot of research. Actually, even in research, I, I will take it as part of my uh, uh, tools that I use, and it takes for, uh, a big percentage in uh, developing my story. So, uh, at a certain level, when you do a lot of research, then you have uh, enough information that you can use uh, in interviewing. Uh, so, your tactics on how you interview can help you to gain uh, a lot of uh, information from your sources, which can be helpful uh, in developing the such a story. And uh, I think even journalists should also consider to know why does the story matter, learning on, uh, uh, from uh, uh, your own experience. Why do you want to tell that story? Uh, does that story reflect something? I mean, what is the impact of the story by the end? Of, uh, by the time the story is out, uh, I, I think uh, it can help uh, a lot uh, in terms of uh, having a good story in, uh, specifically in an investigative story. If you know what, uh, why the story matters and how do you choose your stories and why is it even important to your society, you can end up having a good uh, story uh, at the end of the time. So, uh, so I, I talked about research. Uh, sometimes while doing my research, uh, I take much of my time through reading and I read a uh, subject I'm going to do a story on. So when I read that subject at a certain point, I have enough information about what I'm going to work on. I read much and not just reading, but even understanding what I'm reading, which helps me a lot uh, by the time I'm uh, like at the field or I meet some challenges. And when it comes to environmental journalism, it's a bit uh, technical. Let's say uh, like, uh, uh, let's talk about like uh, pollution. You find uh, sometimes it has some scientific uh, proof you have to bring on the table and maybe you are not a scientist. So the more you do more research, the more you discuss uh, with a lot of people, you get more information on uh, uh, that. Uh, you get more information on the subject you're working on, which helps you a lot uh, to, to, to at least convince your audience. Because when you tell this scientific, uh, like scientific uh, information, uh, you think about even the audience, how they will understand that scientific information. So the way to tell that uh, such an information is when you also understand the information better, such that you can even get a way to explain it to, such, uh, to, to other people. So uh, I think sometimes the research is well needed and uh, we need to give it uh, more of time in uh, a way we do our stories. Because like uh, in Rwanda newsrooms, I have had a chance to pass through almost all Rwanda newsrooms. I, I have participated in almost all of them. And uh, the way stories are done is that if you, you wake up in the morning, you go in the newsroom, then you pitch a story, then the editor proves it, then they want a story at night. Uh, so uh, the, the, the way you do such a story, it cannot uh, easily impact the society because you are doing it just to make uh, sure you meet the target. You don't have, uh, I guess at a certain point, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as a journalist, you don't have to, uh, to, to have like uh, a limit on, on when the story is supposed to be out, but the story should drive you on when it's supposed to be out. It should be, uh, for you as a journalist, should just go until you reach where you see you have the all needed information uh, such that you can uh, proceed. Uh, another thing which I actually talk about from the perspective of the experience from uh, Rwandan coverage and uh, Rwandan media in general, specialization. In Rwanda, we don't have uh, specialization. You see, like uh, the, 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 the journalism network, uh, environmental journalism network here, you might find someone in that same uh, network and is even in the sports network, 
is even in the, the, the entertainment network, is even in the investigative network. So you end up finding someone has failed to specialize, which uh, actually uh, makes you have little knowledge about a certain specific topic. And uh, I believe that if uh, you specialize, you can learn much into your specialization, which can help on how you do your stories, well informative, and even you as a person, you develop through that specific line. So I believe if it is like an environmental uh, network for journalists, like what is here in Rwanda, journalists uh, in, in such a network should just stay in that network and, and learn more from that network and learn much as they can. Uh, what uh, I can even add on, uh, personally, when I'm doing such stories, uh, like uh, I, I try to make sure and think of my digital security as a journalist, how I keep my data, how I keep my information, how I protect my sources, even the credibility. We know uh, fellow, uh, my fellow journalists who have attended from Rwanda, you know very well how the media is not trustable in the ground. You know, citizens don't trust media. So uh, as journalists, at a certain point, we need ourselves to develop that uh, credibility to the public to the extent that people are, uh, can trust us, can, can trust us, we can talk with them, we can discuss with them, and they can understand uh, at a certain point we can, they, we can get, because stories, they are within those people, but at a certain point they don't trust what we tell them, they don't trust what we do, which makes them uh, apart from us. And the information we get from them sometimes is limited because they don't trust us. Uh, so I think we have that, that homework and we have to continuously work on it, on developing our credibility in, our, in the public, uh, which can be helpful. And uh, before, personally, I go to field, before I go to field to film, before I go to field to write, before I go to field to record with a recorder, I move. I move and I reach to the field and I just discuss with citizens, I discuss with people around parks, I discuss, let's say, like an environmental story like on parks, you can go and uh, discuss with the community around them. You get information. What do they have? You don't know. Because when you come, uh, the, the, the biggest problem in our newsrooms, and we know it very well, we normally go on the field when we know what we want. And when we don't bring that specific thing we went on the field uh, in need, uh, in need it, it, it becomes a challenge in the newsroom. Even editors sometimes ask you, you told me you're going to bring this and you, you're out with this. So you, you end up limiting yourself. I believe that uh, the first step should be moving to the field, discussing with those citizens on the ground, understanding their stories. By the time you pitch your story, you have enough information on the story, uh, on the ground. So personally, uh, I believe that uh, storytelling is technical and uh, storytelling is everywhere in the world due to the impact of social media. Uh, as of now, we have social media platforms, uh, which actually is taking over the, 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 the youth and the whole world in general. So uh, storytelling has become something normal in our daily life. So every person is telling a story at a certain point of time. So uh, I am a journalist. Uh, I am a journalist, but journalism like songs, like uh, even like tweets is all about storytelling, uh, I believe. And so even journalism is technical. Uh, as I, I said before, the, the, the morals of profession dictate three things uh, as journalists. Uh, that is to inform, educate, and entertain. Uh, and uh, my question to you, and you can even put it uh, like you can, we can put it in the chat. My question to you, random journalists, uh, we actually, uh, how many uh, of you think that random journalism today is doing uh, exactly what we are supposed to do as a, as a journalist. Uh, maybe you can put your answers there and we can even discuss more about them. Uh, journalism today in Rwanda, according to me, is not doing the job that it's supposed to be doing. And uh, uh, I, I relate it on uh, what I see as a journalist on my daily basis uh, work. Let me take an example of our news bulletin. Uh, when we take an example of our news uh, bulletin, uh, like in the, in the, like, 
let, let me not mention a, a TV station or any station because uh, I saw a lot of journalists uh, from different stations joined. Uh, you can find like news bulletins. Today in the news, Official X donated cows to citizens of Y district and uh, when the environmental, we have an environmental analyst from X company and Y company to analyze why this was needed and how it is positively impact citizens of the district Y and somewhere in the middle there is the objective of the story. Uh, to me, I, I, I normally ask myself a question uh, and if, if, such is, if, if our news bulletin is like that, where is the truth? Uh, where is the truth in uh, what have been reported? Uh, you will find that there is no truth. Yeah, or you can tell me uh, such a news bulletin. To, uh, the, you can even uh, uh, put it in the co in the comments. Uh, do you think uh, there is a, tr a truth in such a news bulletin? And we normally see that on our on our stations, a bit private and even uh, public. Personally, I don't think it is there. We co we consistently see uh, in local media, but it is a bit public uh, or private. But not through investigation, uh, not through investigation, such uh, information. And uh, we are using media, talking to almost all Rwandans, talking to almost all Rwandans, and even beyond. But uh, we, we decide to, to, to violate the rights, actually, or the, the, our powers. That's how I take it. Uh, so uh, what is the reason behind uh, it? Among others, so and then and then, and then you, will, you, you as a journalist, you will find that you have uh, to find out. Besides telling such stories in that way, think about well, why do we have to tell this story? As I said before, what is its impact to my society? And this can happen, but such kind of news bulletins can happen even a whole week. When the weekend hits in, yeah, we elegantly slide into gossip. And uh, personally, I, I normally ask myself, when did gossip become part of news? And this is what we normally see on our stations, you know, uh, and you, 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 you even, uh, some of you engage your, 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 yourself in such practices or such kind of telling stories. So I, I normally ask my, myself that question every day. So what do I want to say here? Every day we tell stories. Uh, every day, every day actually. But what are we doing every day? We are we are actually putting one block uh, and put it on top of another block, and we put it on top of another block, and put it uh, and uh, and we put a roof on top, and uh, and building an architecture. We are building an architecture, uh, actually an architecture uh, which is our identity, and this is especially important. Uh, as Rwandans uh, to reflect on. So as a journalist, uh, or as we journalists, uh, before publishing a story, I think we have to think much about the impact it will bring to our society. Uh, we have been doing these stories, you know, M28 investigates is now one year old, now one year old. I have been trying, you know how challenging doing journalism, investigative journalism in Rwanda is, you know that. But uh, we have been, passing through it and try, because I, I think media have to have another law in um, society than telling these uh, stories, uh, which I normally call the other work. So, yeah, just a second, someone, uh, could, could you start to wrap? No, sorry to interrupt you for a second. Could you start wrapping up, please? I sent you Pardon? a private message. Could you start to wrap up your time? It's up. OK, sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, what I'm what I'm trying to say. Uh, let, let, let me first ask a, a, a question. Those you can put the the, the, the responses in the uh, chat. Uh, my fellow journalists that have attended this webinar. Uh, when was your last time to watch RBA? RBA that's Rwanda Broadcasting Agency. Yeah, if it is in Kenya, it is KBC. If it is in Tanzania, it's CBC. It is in Uganda, it is UBC, and the BBC, BC, BC, everywhere. They, they, they are full over the continent. I guess few of we have been watching the, 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 the Arabia, our public broadcasters, uh, because of uh, uh, 
a different reason. But to myself, I, I think our public broadcasters have been bastardized because of the interference of the political elite, uh, mostly where the first five stories, uh, they are like, uh, today president went to east somewhere. After that, he turned around and spoke to his deputy and then he turned around once break citing afternoon guess who is our president. So the, the, those are the first uh, five stories. The all, all days, all days. So uh, we are building a history, and 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 and, and, and the, our public broadcasters uh, are built a, a history of stories, uh, and yet that is just uh, like I, I, I can call it. It's just uh, like an example in the few in the news, uh, by the way, that uh, we normally see on our broadcasters. Uh, which role is the, uh, actually good public broadcaster's role is really essential to deal with our identity. Our public broadcaster uh, does that on daily basis, and we normally see it. And even some journalists are here who normally do that through programming, through news, through culture. I think it's high time that modern journalists to play our role in our community. Um, as Becca, uh, as I'm winding up, as, as Becca, I'm a, I'm a good fan of Bob Murray. And so I will end my talk by quoting him and ask we journalists to think and make use of this quote in our daily life and work. Uh, once he said, I quote, when you live for yourself, you live in vain. And when you live for others, you live again. Uh, that's the architecture, the identity I'm speaking to. The technical things that we do today as journalists inform what we tomorrow, what we are tomorrow, and they must be about others, not specifically about us. We should focus on telling stories that can impact our society, that can help those uh, vulnerable uh, people on ground, uh, which uh, actually, by, by doing that, we'll be living people's lives. So we will stay on whatever cost. So thank you very much, Morocco. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Samuel. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, reflect uh, over uh, some of the, uh, your experience, what you do. I've noted quite a good number of things here. Um, know why the story matters. Uh, reading and understanding or probably doing research is very critical. Um, storytelling is everywhere. Um, and the question to you is, what is the state of the Rwandan, uh, Rwandan journalism today? Um, I suspect some of you, maybe those in the Rwandan Broadcasting uh, Corporation might have uh, views that might be different from that of uh, Samuel. Those are welcome. Please let's share that. Let's have a conversation on that at some point. Uh, but he closes with saying, think about doing impactful stories. Uh, think about doing stories that uh, untold stories, uh, as they are called, or under investigative stories. Uh, there are many of them, uh, and as Samuel has said, there are everywhere. Um, so please think about those. Um, and I'll bring in another component of the discussion now. Um, this might take us to uh, pretty much an, another realm of data, uh, in the sense that uh, to all the things that uh, Samuel has mentioned, it's also important that you're thinking about other innovative ways in which you can do your reporting. And there is no subject better adapted to that kind of reporting like environmental issues, and in this case, wildlife issues. So with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of the press of Rwanda, uh, our distinguished panelists here, if uh, you permit, I would now call on Ms. Madeleine Genga, uh, she is the editor of Info Congo. She's going to do a presentation. Let's keep it to 10 minutes so that we can have enough time for discussion soon after that. Madeleine is going to be looking at innovative approaches to doing uh, reporting. And in this case, she will be talking specifically about uh, how you uh, use the data, uh, data, visuals, and all of that to be able to make uh, create attractive pieces. Excellent. Over to you, Madeleine. I think you are in Duala or in Yaoundé. So greetings to you uh, over there. Listen to you, David. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, among you today, uh, dear friend, journalist colleague from Rwanda. 
So as David just said, I will be speaking about uh, how to innovate, so how which tools to use, uh, which innovative ways of doing uh, investigative journalism on environmental matters. Chers confrères et consoeurs du Rwanda, c'est un réel plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous aujourd'hui pour parler de ces approches innovantes que l'on pourrait euh, appliquer dans le journalisme d'investigation lié aux crimes environnementaux ou alors au trafic d'espèces sauvages. Donc, euh, sans plus tarder, je vais commencer par… Euh, donc, quand on parle de, de crimes environnementaux, l'une des choses importantes pour euh, le journaliste serait d'abord euh, euh, d'identifier ce qu'on entend par, euh, par crimes environnementaux. So, as environmental crimes, we can have uh, illegal logging, bushmeat bush hunting, daylife life trafficking, ivory, ivory trafficking. So, when we as journalists, we… We know what we, we speak about when you speak about environmental crimes. We can identify what are some environmental crimes uh, we can work on is one step, one thing important as, uh, as journalists, what we should do. So um, another thing is to know the challenge. Uh, the other panelists said, mentioned that we, we are working on a topic uh, global, local, global and local topic. So uh, you should know that environmental crimes are transnational problem. So you can be based in Rwanda, you, you work on some environmental crime and you, sh you should know that it's not just Rwanda who have that problem. We have other, another country uh, which has those problems, environmental crime, illegal logging. So it affects people around the world, not just in Rwanda. So we should think about uh, analyzing the problem in the local and in the global context, because um, uh, some, some information from international organizations say that illegal trade and in real life, including timber and fish, comprise the fourth largest global illegal trade after narcotic. Uh, it, it's estimated to be worth at least 19 billion per year, 19 billion dollars per year. So, ça nous permet de voir là quelle est l'ampleur de, de ces crimes environnementaux, les dégâts que ça peut avoir sur euh, le monde entier. Donc, nous devons les analyser non seulement à notre prisme sur le plan local, mais penser global pour que euh, le sujet que nous abordons sur le plan local puisse avoir un impact sur le plan global et contribuer euh, à réduire ces questions environnementales là. Je vais aller droit au but dans les, les exemples d'articles et comment est-ce que nous au niveau d'Info Congo, qui est une plateforme de géojournalisme, de journalisme environnemental. Euh, comment est-ce que nous faisons pour euh, avoir euh, une approche innovante en matière euh, d'investigation journalistique liée aux crimes environnementaux? So, the first story will be on elephants in Africa. So, uh, you have the link of the story here. We have published it on Info Congo website. So, the, the story, to produce these stories, we did online research. So the story explained how um, elephant in Africa suffer, are in danger. We use online research to have uh, uh, more data about the topic. We also did data analysis. Uh, uh, you can see a graph here uh, about data. So we, we download some, some, uh, um, some data from reports in PDF format and we extract those uh, data set and analyze those data set to have these things. And we add these uh, maps, this um, graph in our reports. So we use online research, data analysis and data visualization. We also use interview with experts and uh, we also um, try to analyze NGOs reports. So it's just to, to let us know that if we want to innovate in our way of doing investigative journalism on environmental matters, we should think about combining uh, data we can find online, information we can find online with interviews, in expert from interview and having some images or visualization that we can, that can help the, the reader better understand our story. So this is some of the mixed we, we are doing, we are using on at Info Congo. The second story is about um, Chinese plantation. So the relation 
between um, Chinese plantation and bee life pressure. So to produce this story, you can also find the link of the story uh, in our document here. So to produce this story that you can read on Info Congo website, our, our journalist, our journalist went on field. So it's uh, in East region in Cameroon. He was on field around uh, a national reserve. So he, he, he had a discussion, he had discussion with communities member. He tried to follow um, how this trade uh, on bee life, how these uh, bee life animals are selling the market. And he also tried to speak with authority to, to follow the, the road of those uh, uh, life animals. So we have investigative field trip from forest city to from forest areas to city. He also used multimedia packages. So when we, he was on field, he had he made some few short video uh, pictures and so on. And he also inter had interview with communities members and experts. And at the end, he also uh, used NGOs reports. Donc, euh, dans les deux exemples d'articles que je viens de présenter, le premier article qui parlait de, des, éléments de, de, des éléphants de forêt qui sont en péril, euh, nous pouvons constater qu'à Info Congo, nous avons utilisé, nous avons combiné plusieurs euh, approches innovantes, non seulement cette approche traditionnelle qui consiste à ce que le journaliste aille sur le terrain, vérifie des informations, mais nous avons ajouté également euh, une approche. Euh, innovante d'utilisation des données. Et la plupart des données que nous utilisons dans les articles que nous, avons, que nous publions sur Info Congo sont des données qui sont disponibles en ligne. Cela suppose que nous faisons beaucoup de recherches en ligne pour télécharger des rapports, extraire des tableaux qui sont dans ces rapports, les analyser pour trouver l'information, trouver la faille qu'il y a dans, 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 dans l'information le, le, qui est dans le document et pouvoir faire notre sujet. Et en, à cela, nous ajoutons aussi des, des analyses, des évaluations de données. Donc, vous pouvez voir des cartes qui accompagnent nos articles. Ça fait que le lecteur, euh, le sujet approche un peu plus le lecteur. Parce que si nous voulons raconter juste de façon traditionnelle, d'avoir de, des témoignages des gens qui disent, voilà, c'est grave, il y a trop de trafic d'animaux ici, euh, ce n'est pas toujours pertinent. Mais en ajoutant les données, ça donne plus de pertinence à notre texte en matérialisant ces données par des cartes et des visualisations, euh, ça donne plus d'attraction. Ça, ça fait que celui qui regarde notre texte est plus attiré et il peut euh, mieux lire le texte, plus rapidement le comprendre et ça peut avoir plus d'impact sur euh, euh, ceux qui lisent le texte. So the last story uh, I will show you is about um, uh, illegal traffic of um, another uh, species. So in DRC, what on, one of the country we cover at Info Congo, uh, the, gov the government have uh, said that we should not sell this type of uh, um, the, uh, the, this type of view of real life. So, but in in the in daily life, you have people selling this, and this journalist, our journalist, he went on field to. So to know how the situation was. So he also find uh, information from scientists publication. So, and he also have interview with experts. You can see here uh, a maps, a maps showing protected area. You know that some of these species are located in protected area in the Congo Basin or Central African region. So when you, you add or you combine storytelling with these maps, um, the, the reader can identify the area where you are working on or even look on some other um, protected area to, and better understand the topic. So at Infogongo, we try to combine these new tools or these new ways of doing journalism to raise awareness or to tell story about Bill life trafficking about environmental crime. And one thing or something important that it uh, 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 gives to our story is that story can be half fact. So you, you don't just have those testimony or so you don't have, you have facts, you have data, you have proof on what you are saying and proof from accurate sources. And one of the sources uh, we use to produce our 
our investigative story at Ipu Congo is uh, Global Forest Watch. Uh, you have you can you have the link to 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 have to visit us to explore Global Forest Watch data. So this is an online platform, an open data platform. I can say like that. When you, where you can find uh, data on forest change, on uh, environmental crime like deforestation. So journalists can go on that uh, open data platform, try to explore maybe Rwanda to see what you have as a um, tree cover loss for one year or for 10 years. Maybe you are investigating on the relation between deforestation and villi trafficking and want to know what is the stage of tree cover loss in the area you are working on. This can be a, a, a platform where you can find the data and analyze those data. You can also have the, the possibility of adding maps uh, and visualization to your reports. So, and this will bring the innovative uh, way on, to, on, your, on your storytelling. So you add storytelling and um, data visualization. So what do we, what we learn, what we have learned from doing uh, this investigative journalism on real life trafficking or environmental crime is that uh, it's important to use data and it's most, the most and it's also important to combine the data and local community voice. Um, as we know, as we all know, environmental crime is not just about the environmental matters, it's about human life. So if we are just speaking about environment, environment, it, uh, it will not be very interesting for us. We should know that environment is linked to human. So we are, we are, we are together, we, we have to stay together. So when we are working as journalists, we have to link environmental crime and um, human rights or human, human life. And to do that, we should, we have to combine data and local community voice. And beyond the environmental uh, aspect of, uh, of working on this uh, investigative journalism on environmental matters, uh, to tell the story on how those crimes affect our finance. So it's not just about telling that, okay, we have this species which are in danger, but we should know wh how, what is the cost or how it affects our finance, how it affects our social life, how it, our, it affects our food security or well being. So, this is another way of working on those topics and to innovate on working on those topics to have the link. What is the link between real life trafficking and finance? For example, in Rwanda, what is the link between food security and real life tra trafficking or environmental crime in Rwanda? When we have data on these different topics and we have community voices, we can tell a better story and more powerful story on environmental crime. So I've proposed some lists here for website or for platform where journalists can find uh, data or information to work on environmental crime. So these are platforms we, we are using on daily basis on, at Info Congo. Donc, en termes de, de plateformes sur lesquelles les journalistes peuvent trouver des informations leur permettant de travailler sur les crimes environnementaux, comme je l'ai parlé, nous, nous utilisons beaucoup des recherches en ligne et nous savons qu'en tant que journalistes, il y a des sources crédibles, il y a des sources euh, peut-être un peu plus éloignées les unes des autres. Donc, en termes de sources, nous allons régulièrement, nous travaillons beaucoup avec les ONG qui sont spécialisées dans le domaine. Donc, nous ne pouvons pas travailler sur les crimes environnementaux, ça envoie la cartographie des organisations euh, qui travaillent sur ces questions-là dans nos pays, au Rwanda, quelles sont les organisations qui travaillent sur les crimes environnementaux, sur euh, le trafic d'espèces sauvages, nous, pouvons, nous devons pouvoir les identifier. Euh, nous travaillons aussi beaucoup avec les, les autorités locales, donc ça peut être la police nationale, les, le service douanier, on sait que plusieurs fois les services douaniers disent, voilà, on a fait tel nombre de saisies d'animaux cette semaine, en faisant des recherches documentaires, des recherches en ligne, on peut remonter sur toute cette base de données-là et faire un article peut-être sur euh, la situation des perroquets, comme on l'a vu tout à l'heure, ou la situation des éléphants au Rwanda, mais euh, sans se limiter au simple communiqué qui a été euh, publié à l'instant, puis on fait une petite brève, mais on fait une enquête de fond 
en remontant sur un an, deux ans, qu est quelle est la situation de ces perroquets, quelle est la situation de ces éléphants. Et en termes de données, pour que notre texte soit encore plus enrichissant, plus, plus pertinent, euh, nous pouvons visiter des, des, des sites comme euh, euh, le site de l'Union internationale pour la conservation de la nature, euh, qui peut nous donner la liste des espèces menacées d'extinction, parce que toutes les espèces sont importantes pour l'humanité, mais il y a celles qui sont plus en danger. Et en tant que journaliste, c'est toujours bon de pouvoir euh, savoir quelles sont ces espèces, laquelle est la situation. Et ça, c'est l'une des sources où nous pouvons nous abreuver régulièrement. Il y a également l'organisation Trafic qui euh, régulièrement fait le monitoring de la situation euh, des animaux sauvages, de la situation des crimes environnementaux. Et là aussi, sur leur page, nous pouvons, sur leur site internet, nous pouvons trouver des données. Il y a aussi des organisations comme euh, Environmental Investigation Agency qui publient quelquefois des rapports sur cette question-là. Et sur le site de la Banque mondiale aussi, vous pouvez avoir euh, des données sur euh, les aires protégées, des données sur euh, euh, les mammifères, les espèces de mammifères qui sont menacées d'extinction et faire un lien avec votre pays. Donc, avoir les données sur le plan local, mais aussi sur les données sur le plan international parce qu'on a dit que c'est un sujet qui n'est pas seulement abordé sur le plan local. Il faut bien avoir une approche globale parce que les questions environnementales ne concernent pas que nous, dans notre petit quartier, dans notre petite communauté. Ce sont des questions qui touchent au-delà de notre communauté. Et avoir une vision globale quand nous traitons de ces questions-là, ça donne plus de pertinence à notre texte. Il y a aussi l'organisation Interpol. Interpol aussi fait régulièrement euh, des travaux sur... Euh, la situation des crimes environnementaux dans le monde. Donc, à partir de leur site, à partir de leur communiqué, ça peut être leur compte Twitter, ça peut être euh, leur page sur les réseaux sociaux. Vous pouvez avoir plein d'informations qui vous permettent de travailler sur un sujet lié aux crimes environnementaux. Donc, en termes d'outils, euh, j'ai parlé tout à l'heure du fait que nous avons parfois fait des recherches en ligne où nous avons téléchargé des documents et dans certains documents, il y avait des, des tableaux euh, donc, nous utilisons quelques outils pour pouvoir extraire ces tableaux-là, ces outils comme Open Refine, comme Tableau-là, par exemple, pour extraire les tableaux, les analyser et sortir des visualisations. Si nous voulons raconter une histoire dans le temps, en faisant que ce soit imagé, nous pouvons utiliser un, un outil comme Timeline. Tous, tous ces outils-là sont des outils qui sont gratuits, euh, que les journalistes peuvent les utiliser pour analyser leurs données, pour les visualiser euh, sur les questions de crimes environnementaux. Donc, euh, merci pour votre aimable attention. Et... Je reste ouverte pour toutes les questions. Thank you very much. Merci infiniment, euh, Madeleine Ging. Quelle présentation euh, vraiment très riche. Euh, euh, je vous invite certainement de partager votre présentation. Je pense que euh, les collègues du Rwanda auront besoin de votre présentation, surtout parce que vous avez des très bons euh, liens et des ressources à consulter, surtout pour ceux qui s'intéressent à la question. Je vais switcher en anglais tout simplement parce qu'il me semble qu'il y a plus euh, de participants qui euh, sont euh, plus ou moins confortables en anglais. Donc, euh, avec votre permission, je vais switcher en anglais. Um, there are quite a good number of questions here about whether we are going to share the presentations. I think Bernard is already answered to that and saying this is to Jean-Claude. Uh, yes, we will share all the presentations. So that shouldn't be a problem. So Jean-Claude. Uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, we will make sure that everyone gets the presentation because we know that you need all of those resources for you to be able to be successful. We don't intend this discussion to end here, but it has to continue both with your personal research, something that Samuel alluded to, but also that you can have all of these links. So that's going to be done. Uh, I do have a question here for uh, the two panelists before we move on to our friend Greg. Uh, who is the last presenter for this afternoon. I think the question is from, uh, um, did it disappear? I had that a few minutes ago, just a second. I think Jean-Claude had a question about the fact that uh, environmental issues and conservation issues are not always accepted in the newsroom as we might want. So the question is how do you convince journalists uh, to be able to, or editors rather, to make sure that Uh, they can support this uh, sort of project. So I don't know if uh, Madeleine would want to provide some thoughts for Samuel. Please feel free to go ahead and tell us how, how you can do that. But most importantly, uh, these discussions we've had it on several occasions. So as recent as uh, two months ago with the Rainforest Journalism Network of the Police Center, we had another discussion. And I think the overall conclusion was like, 
a lot of journalists, editors don't go for these stories. So how do you make sure that they are convincing? I suspect uh, the two panelists have raised some of these issues already. So why don't you we hear your thoughts with respect to that question before we can move on to Greg? Starting with Samuel, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, myself, uh, I believe, and I agree with uh, 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 that, that in many newsrooms, uh, environmental stories are not I even... I uh, to give it to you, because we can barely hear you, please. Thank you. Pardon? I, w I was trying to say, can you hear me? Yeah, take your can microphone you closer. Take your microphone closer, because okay. we can barely hear you. Okay, I, I was trying to say that uh, environmental stories are not uh, much acceptable in, uh, uh, in newsrooms and uh, are very tricky. But the main reason, according to me, is because uh, uh, people don't know how sensitive is the environment. Uh, let's, uh, by environmental stories uh, uh, contact us directly as uh, citizens and, uh, and uh, they affect the electric our lives because uh, let's say pollution air pollution uh, you can but uh, personally even if I'm the editor I can consider like a political story than considering an, uh, an environmental story however it does not make it right because uh, we have to understand the fact that uh, everything we work on uh, our daily life rotates around the environment and uh, these are the stories we need to tell such that we can teach our own hair, how we breathe. If someone is cutting trees, uh, recently I started a campaign of planting trees myself. And the main reason why I started that campaign of planting trees is because uh, I was in one of the, the, the like the eastern province of, uh, of Rwanda, the place is very clean. They, they, they removed all the trees. Uh, so I, I think we have to first understand and uh, do stories actually, like journalists, that can educate what it means to, 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 uh, to, to, to cut trees, to kill animals, uh, what is the purpose of these trees in the society. So when to, we come to understand how sensitive is environmental stories, then it will be given space in the, in the newsroom. And the main issue, the problem now comes when these reporters are not, have not managed even to specialize in such a, a field or one field such that they can at least tell these stories from, from a perspective of knowledge. If someone is teaching a story on environment and is not even uh, able to convince the editor and other news members or other journalists in the, in the newsroom, if you are pitching such a story on environment and you cannot convince these people that this story is needed much more even than uh, a story of uh, maybe the president attending a, a football game or a basketball game, if you, can, if you fail to convince the editor with your fellow news uh, reporters in the same newsroom, so then it, it is an impact of not having enough knowledge on how this is and how sensitive it is. So when we specialize or when journalists uh, in environmental fields try to specialize, they will be pitching from a, a knowledge perspective, which can be easily for these uh, stories to be acceptable in newsrooms. That's what I think is uh, much more needed. Specialization and learning more. Investing your time in making research on environmental issues because it's a field you have chosen to go for. Investing your time in getting more knowledge about it. Learning from what others have done. So by the time you are pitching this in the newsroom, it can even be considered because you are trying to explain how you build their story. But you cannot say I'm going to do a story and you cannot even explain it through the way you are pitching it. And you think editors would consider it as quick as they can consider something uh, like this, the other thing which is around. So I think it's a, a, an issue of not being specialized on such a specific uh, topic. And even considering the fact that if you are an environmental journalist that you are in a newsroom, there will be, the, the, the news editor will expect only environmental stories from your side. So if you don't have that specialization, that's why you teach and they don't consider it. Because you cannot be in a newsroom when you are an environmental journalist and they expect you to pick something else from environmental issues. So I think uh, journalists have just and learned more about the field they have chosen to specialize in. Well, thank you so much, uh, 
Samuel. That's very much appreciated. Madeleine, any thoughts on that before we uh, go over to uh, our friend and uh, brother Greg, who is not connected? Yes, yes, David. Thank you for for this opportunity. So I totally agree with uh, colleague with colleague, and uh, I think this is a great point. And I do understand how it's difficult in our context to convince uh, some editor to, to let us work on environmental topic and use data on those environmental topic. And uh, as Samuel said, uh, I think one important thing is about specialization. And it's true that it's difficult to be specialized because in our newsroom, uh, some of the journalists think that it's important to be to work on different on all the topic and other thing is important to be specialized. And if you want to convince our editor, uh, like I can take uh, maybe the, the example of how I did to, to be specialized on environmental topic, I try with so small stories about uh, maybe uh, float in my town, uh, so small topic about environmental issues. And uh, I try to learn new tools on how to report on those topics. So attend training, be trained on this topic, uh, attend even training with uh, experts, environmental experts who know the challenges because it's difficult for us to convince when we don't know the challenges and how the, those environmental crimes affect our daily life. And uh, if we have all those knowledge and we know how to use those knowledge, I think we will have um, enough resources to to, to better pitch the story to our editor. So uh, I, I, what I will say that uh, learn, learn new things, new, have new, acquire new knowledge, know the challenge and uh, try to know how environmental crime affect daily life to be able to convince others to, to give you the opportunity to work on environmental topics. Thank you. Thank you, Madeleine, for that complimentary information. Um, with your permission, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, it should be uh, somewhere around 421 in uh, Kigali, sometimes around 521 in, in, in Nairobi. Um, so I think we should move on. Uh, we only have 40 more minutes, so I think it'd be important for us to uh, move on to the last presentation. And after that, we can then engage uh, in some very substantive discussions. We are already, which I think was one of the main reasons why we're here. And I think for most of you, we've been on the call so far, about 50 of you, which is great. Uh, I think you've had quite some useful tools already. So I suspect that uh, we can all pat ourselves in the back in terms of how well we are working, isn't it? So that's great. Um, so for most of you who are in Rwanda, you know this better than I. Um, in the meantime, just to uh, back up a little bit, shall I say that the question that led us to this point of uh, how do we get better stories of sort of frame our stories, write better pitches in a way they can be accepted came in from Eve uh, Rugira. Eve works for Radio Salus, uh, that's in uh, Rwanda. So I just thought I'd mention that little quick because that's important. So for those of you in Rwanda, you know this better than I, that the Rwanda's volcanic national park, uh, the VNP, is uh, obviously the site of the volcano or the Jirunga Mountains, rather, uh, which is considered probably one of the best or the most important uh, Biodiversity conservation uh, hotspots in the in, in the, in, the uh, uh, in, in in our region and in, uh, throughout the continent. There's a significant part of it in the DRC, uh, which a lot of uh, our reporters have worked there before. Uh, and there is an organization that works there. It's known as Red Rocks uh, Rwanda. It's essentially a community-based uh, tourism organization or enterprise. Uh, they work with local communities, uh, and so we've invited uh, one of the officials here today, and we are so glad, glad that Mr. Greg uh, Bakunzi uh, could join us to be able to uh, sort of share the experience. Shall I just say here that if you had the program, you might have noticed that there was an official of the Rwandan Environmental Protection or Management Agency uh, who was invited, uh, but uh, in the last minute, uh, for other reasons, he could not participate, and that's why uh, you have Mr. Greg stepping in for him. So Greg, if you are listening, we we'll want to hear your experience. Keep in mind that when we wanted the official from government, it was for us to understand what are the policies in place. Because in terms of how the narrative goes, 
Rwanda is doing relatively better than maybe uh, Kenya or maybe Tanzania or maybe Uganda in terms of wildlife management. But the point here is, why is it that Rwanda is doing great? And so at some point, literature that we see points to the fact that it's because of policy, it's because of the laws uh, put in place by government. So we had wanted to hear those laws, and that's why we wanted somebody from the Rama to be able to participate. But that not having happened, it's not a big issue. We can provide you details. Obviously, you guys know uh, the road to Rama better than any of us here. So uh, we can always reach out to them. But the fact of bringing the NGO, in this case, Red Rocks, to speak to us is to be able to share a little bit of their work in this specific uh, biodiversity hotspot. But most importantly, it would be important that we can provide us tips for stories. Keep in mind that you're talking to journalists. They want to know where to get stories. This is what we survive on. If you have stories, you go to your newsroom, you're happy because you can present that to the editor. So if you can provide some hints in terms of how you get those, that will also be welcome. So ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Mr. Uh, Greg uh, Bakun, uh, Bakunzi. Uh, he is uh, part of the Red Rocks Initiative for Sustainable Development. You have 10 minutes, uh, so up until 4.35 your time. Over to you. Thanks, David. Thanks for allowing me to um, to go uh, to give you my pre quick presentation. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, please turn on your camera as well. Or if uh, yeah, you uh, can, share, yeah. Please go ahead and share your screen. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm gonna share my story behind this because I'm getting there some difficulties too. Uh, you know, uh, depending on where I am, I'm just based in Musanze, where it's up in the mountain. I would like to say uh, I'm so happy to be invited and let me at um, this panelist. Uh, even though I'm, uh, I'm not a journalist for the environmental protection, but I'm more involved in community-based tourism, which is also uh, a kind of a part of the environmental protection and the wildlife. Uh, what we are doing, uh, what we are doing in our area, we have set up an organization. Called Red Rocks Initiative for Sustainable Development. And the whole idea of the organization is to see how can community uh, conservation and tourism get really linked together. Uh, and we use, we use different aspects whereby the local communities are going to be benefiting from uh, the conservation, the wildlife, especially like the gorillas that attracted the tourists to come there. So how can they do that? So what we did, we have developed different uh, programs that benefit the local communities. As journalists, of course, um, our, most of the local communities that reside along the protected areas, they may not get a chance to read a story that was written by David or by James, but they are able to read the story through another angle. And now we are trying to see what kind of angle can we use to get the message of the environment and at the same time benefits them. So what we did, we set up uh, an art for conservation. With this art of conservation, there are so many youth uh, communities around the protected areas who are coming in and do their some artwork which are connected to environment, which are connected to nature, to wildlife, so they get to sell those uh, artwork, which has got the message. It doesn't even go just a lot within the local communities, but also the guests who come there, they take it as uh, the new, they take it, I, and they take an artwork that is made by the local communities, which symbol, uh, symbols the environment, the conservation, they still remember that, so it's like a newspaper to them. So that's how we are, um, we are working with our uh, organization. And then from there, we thought, okay, we don't want just to keep this message around the, uh, the Volcano National Park, but we also want to drive it to deep uh, into the local communities. And what we did set up uh, what we call Red Rocks Community Conservation Centers. And with this, we have already set two. One is the uh, eastern part, and then we have two more which have been set up um, 
uh, in Gisenyi. And now we are still really trying to see how can we set up more of those community conservation centers that keeps on sending the message through the benefits where the local communities who might be the enemies of the environment start benefiting from that. When it comes direct to the, um, a few questions uh, that were sent to me, uh, you know, in what, uh, what are we doing to, 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 you know, to investigate the environmental journalism or to fight the wildlife crimes? And that's a part of fighting the wildlife crimes. When we want to fight that, the first thing we do, we check the area, we see how can those people who live around there start benefiting from what they are really doing. So we have, see, and we thought that through those small income generating projects, and also to carry on some workshops. And these workshops, we tell them the message we are trying, we, and from these messages, we have seen that through uh, the, if, if the conservation, if the environment is well, well managed by the local communities, it would be another uh, industry that can still benefit the local communities direct, where they are really getting like some small income. Uh, this will stop uh, things like poaching, of course. This is going to stop like trafficking of environmental crimes as illegal lodging. This is also going to develop the local communities that are also um, residing along those protected areas. So within our area, we, we are not, uh, I have to say we have been in this operation for the last four years and we still uh, have a lot of, uh, of course, challenges uh, and putting us, uh, putting our, our message out there, it's gonna need the journalism uh, like the us, where you guys can come and write about any kind of story or how, can, how are we doing that? And also talk to the local communities that have benefited from our programs. So uh, we would really like to invite, I will be sharing here, I wouldn't be able to share the, the whole short presentation that uh, uh, the story that we have, but I'm, uh, I'm happy to share that, uh, to send it to you right away um, after this short uh, presentation. If any of the journalists need any information, I'd be there to assist in providing information which will benefit uh, the, both of us, not only the, uh, the journalists, but also benefits our organization. Um, let me uh, stop there and just let uh, people ask a few questions before I end up with uh, um, my presentation. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Greg, for stepping in uh, at such a short notice and for sharing the story of your organization. I suspect that for most of the journalists here present, they already have maybe an idea of what you do. Uh, and if you don't, please uh, seize the opportunity to take a look at them, look at their website. Uh, Madeleine mentioned NGOs as a critical source. You never know where the story is going to come from. So why don't you take a look at that, particularly if you're writing on environmental issues and interested in the uh, volcanic mountain areas of Rwanda. Uh, why not even on the other side of the borders? In fact, that is a transboundary issue, isn't it? So we have about 28 minutes to go. I'll summarize a couple of things here in terms of take home points. We started off with uh, the do, uh, executive director of the EGN uh, speaking about this uh, global network of close to 13,000 journalists functioning in almost all countries, bringing together a different network of journal, uh, journalists uh, from across the world, for which uh, even the Rwandan Environmental uh, Journalist Network can now join, uh, because as we learned from someone, there is one in Rwanda, so please feel free to join. He provided quite a good number of resources that might be important for you. Visit their website, uh, look at the Info Congo website, Info Nile, our speakers, uh, look at uh, Inti News, uh, the parent organization of EGN. Look at Inti News East Africa, where our brother Kindo uh, is uh, working, uh, working with, or where he's working, uh, as well as uh, Benon uh, Oluka, uh, who is uh, the investigative uh, uh, editor. 
Uh, please take a look at those resources. They always have. And because uh, you are not just looking at this, uh, particularly from the territorial geographical location in which you are, but more from a global perspective, they can be very helpful to you. So that's exactly what we learned coming out of uh, uh, James's uh, uh, presentation. Essentially, it was about the EGEN. And also sign up to the Facebook page, or maybe just visit the website. There is an email list of 13,000 journalists. And if you all join, you band together, it's easy for you to be able to get support from one another, right? Because there's a lot of mentorship, storytelling, investigative reports, and workshop opportunities. Uh, so let's say that by having spent this afternoon, non this organization, it's important that you think about uh, make, maybe becoming a member. Subscription is free, of course. Then we heard from uh, M23 investigate, uh, M28 rather, uh, investigate, uh, obviously not M23, the rebel movement in the east of the country in DRC. Uh, but this is M28 investigate, put in place by our brother, Becker Samuel. Uh, it's been one year old. And I think uh, the fact that he is on the investigative side of things means that a lot of what he was calling attention to is to make sure that we are focusing on in-depth reporting in part because he thinks that's the direction that we should go. Uh, do a lot of research, do a lot of reading, understand the issues. Environmental issues are by nature very complex and they are not only environmental. Environmental is politics, it's also economy, it's social. So it's important that you're reading very broadly for you to be able to identify. And later on, when you go to the newsroom and pitch stories that you know exactly what you're talking about because that's the only way we convince editors to be able to accept to do our stories or let our stories go in the news in the midday or maybe the prime news in the evening. Storytelling is everywhere. He said that, and I think everybody understands that. That's important. But also that it's a moment to reflect on the state of uh, journalism in Rwanda. He asked the question, I haven't yet seen an answer. And I think that should constitute part of the discussion as we move forward. What is the state of uh, journalism in Rwanda today? Uh, he has his opinion, and we respect that. I suspect you do have yours. Uh, but beyond even the fact of saying that maybe uh, there is a lot of live reporting, just maybe the who, what, we, where, and how, and that sort of thing, what is it that we can do to improve? And this webinar is partly a solution to that, which is to arm you with some of the tools that might be required. Uh, but most importantly, do impactful reporting because you want to be identified with that down the road. That's exactly what he was saying here. Look at reporting on vulnerable people, the kind of thing that are caught somewhere else on the reported stories. So look at those, not just the politics or the political stories, because of course those uh, can keep the headlines going, but there are a lot of people who are left in the margin. And because you have a role of voice of the voiceless, it's important that you are looking at those stories. So that's what uh, uh, Baker uh, more or less focused on. Uh, that's my take home. Now, Madeleine came in with an angle, which I think for the most part, some of you may already be familiar with, which is that the only way you shift from who, what, when, how, where, which is more or less what constitutes our daily reporting, is to start using data and using other sources and visuals that allow you to be able to have not only a coherent and evidence-based or database narrative, but also that you have visuals that are attractive to the reader. The science of journalism is telling us today that very few people in the internet spend time on any story. It doesn't matter how good it or not well written it may be. You can take six months. People may still not read in part because there's very little patience for, journal, for people uh, going online. And so how do you make sure you capture the attention? So eternally, people are thinking, what is the next thing that we can do to be able to keep the audience? So if you have interactive content and with data, good visuals, good graphs, you can be able to make you can be sure that you'll be, you'll be able to attract people. And I think that Madeleine uh, gave a few case studies, gave us the methodology of work, what she does, from the moment they think through the reporting to the moment they do online research, which is text work, doing a lot of data gathering, uh, thinking about visuals, interviewing people, because this is important. Context is always important. You can get a story, but until you go on the ground and speak to people, you may never know exactly what it is all about. And NGO reports look at those. So that's the methodology that Mark then uses. She talked about that in one story, endangered African elephants. She gave you that methodology, as well as two other uh, uh, case studies, Chinese plantations and wildlife in Africa, uh, how they did all of that work. So that was important. I think it's also critical to say here that environmental crimes and wildlife are typically transboundary. 
I'm not the one saying it, Madeleine said that. And even if uh, um, I said that, uh, obviously it will be based on our, my own uh, reporting experience. These issues, particularly in East Africa, uh, if you do a supply chain, you will see that things leave uh, the, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, and they find themselves in the Eastern market in, in India, uh, Vietnam, I don't know, China, or maybe sometimes in, 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 in Europe. But I guess because of international protocols and that sort of thing, you see a little bit of uh, limitation in terms of importing these illegal materials into uh, the European countries because the European Union has a lot more stringent rules. So that's what Madeleine focused on, and I thought that was very important. But she went on to say that it's important to add a community and a local voice to this. So to the data, it's one data is one thing. The other thing is making sure that uh, local voices are also represented because this is about people. And don't just talk about crime for the sake of talking about crime, but also make sure that you're looking at how it affects our finances, our security, our social life, and food security. So those are very important points that they talked about. The question, of course, is what is it that you think you are taking home with you? What is it that you might want to ask in terms of you need more clarity? What are the questions that you might have? In that case, let's take 25 minutes or 20 more minutes that we have. Uh, let's say 15 minutes because I'd have to give a word to the panelists for a final wrap, wrap up. But I see a question here, and I don't know if this is a question, but this is from Anf de la Vitoire. Uh, a beautiful uh, name right there. Um, and apologies, I can't pronounce your last name quickly because I have to take a while. But I think this is Dusabe uh, Mungu. Dusabe Mungu Ange La Vitoire. She's saying this conversation was great, uh, but it is uh, it is like moving people to protect the biodiversity and not giving them what they deserve for the property like compensation. So would the story also be an environmental topic? Baker, you want to take that and then we hear from uh, Madeleine. Baker, can you hear me, please? All right, looks like Baker dropped. Thank you so much for that information. Madeleine, do you want to? Uh, sort of uh, provide some in the inputs on Baker's question uh, on the, sorry, uh, Ange de la Vitoire's question. He's saying that um, la question c'est juste de savoir cette discussion est importante, Madeleine, but the, the question is, uh, comment est-ce que uh, on peut protéger soit les personnes ou la biodiversité sans vraiment donner les moyens pour pouvoir compenser les différentes communautés? Donc, uh, uh, Est-ce que ça aussi, c'est par exemple uh, uh, un sujet uh, qu'on peut traiter? OK. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think um, this is another important question. Uh, and uh, I, it can be like I was saying, uh, speaking about environmental crime or real life trafficking is not just about environment or real life. It's about human being. It's about human life. So if you decide as journalists to work on um, compensation or how uh, it affect communities, you will have the voice of communities in the topic. So you can decide to focus on that aspect and we have the relation between uh, this uh, life trafficking or environmental crime and uh, the life of the woman in one area, for example, in Rwanda. So it's always important or it's important to to focus on this type of topic, to have the human life story of somebody affected by all these environmental crime, and it can be a very impactful story. So it's not just about uh, speaking about environmental crime or telling that we should protect. Why should we protect maybe biodiversity? It's for people, it's for human beings. So uh, we sh the link between human and environment is what we as journalists are doing in our topic. and uh, I. The, the, the topic or the subject you are proposing is something uh, something interesting to work on as environmental journalists. So. Thank you very much, uh, Madeleine. Uh, maybe I will just add that um, Ange de la Vitoire should look at, uh, there are a lot of schemes now, what you call co-benefit schemes uh, around, and most countries are implementing them. Co-benefit schemes mean that the environment uh, gains, the community gains, 
uh, those the stakeholders, every stakeholder has something to benefit from. Um, I'm not particularly sure if there are co-benefit schemes in, in Rwanda, but I suspect there would be because Rwanda works with IACN and a lot more of these uh, conservation organizations. So that is to the heart of your story because what that does is it does not just ask for conservation for the sake of conservation, but it provides a trade-off to those who are conserving the forest or who own this forest, the indigenous people. Uh, so please, that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, and that's something that you could also take into consideration. The other person that I might want to just call in here to provide some thoughts, but this is because I have a question here from uh, uh, Kaitare Jean Bosco. Kaitare Jean Bosco had asked a question about um, investigative stories. Uh, and because uh, I think Baker has dropped, uh, Emable is here. Emable is also doing this. He's, he's, he's a science journalist based in Kigali. He's been doing a lot of work on the international scene with the International Science Federation of Journalists, as well as with the Rainforest Journalism. And I think he's also done some work with EJ. Uh, the point here would be, uh, Emable, if you want to provide your thoughts, because you've also been uh, helping to be able to groom some more younger journalists. Uh, because the question here from Baker, for rather from Jean Bosco was, uh, how do you overcome the bureaucracy from the local leaders while trying to get information, while doing an investigative story from your perspective? I don't know if you do have any thoughts on that, uh, Emma, if you are still connected. Looks like a marble is not. Are you connected, Emma? Imabli is not a, a panelist, so he might not be able to activate his microphone. I don't know if he can. Oh, Baker, you seem to be back. Yes, Imabli, was that you? I just had uh, uh, a power connection issues, so I'm sorry. There was a question for you, Baker. Samuel Baker. Pardon? Uh, there was a question for you, uh, Jean Bosco. Jean Bosco was saying that, uh, how do you overcome the bureaucracy from the local leaders while trying to inform or to get information while doing investigative stories from your perspective? So he, he, he wanted you to react to that. I don't know if you have any thoughts. This question was specifically for you. Uh, how do I do it? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Well, I think Jean Bosco is just say, simply saying that um, how do you overcome uh, bureaucracy from local leaders? Uh, of course, there is, uh, I suspect these are government uh, bu uh, bureaucrats with all the procedures and the protocols in place. Uh, how do you usually go through that, I suspect, and get the information and be able to do your investigative stories? I think that's, that's the point. OK. Uh First of all, uh, I believe that uh, as a journalist, I need to make everything right like in terms of facts. I, I believe that I need to have uh, my facts right whenever I'm doing a story. And uh, secondly, uh, I also believe that uh, when you have every, uh, when you have facts, your facts right, it's very hard for someone to attack you. And uh, for the sake of, for the issue of how to convince uh, sources and uh, talking to the sources, considering the fact uh, or the state of our 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 environment, uh, I think it uh, it's all about befriending sources, uh, meeting sources first before interviewing them. You make them friends, you discuss with them, you understand them before bringing out your recorder and camera or anything or your book and, uh, and a pen to write uh, i think you just have to first even create that relationship between you and uh, the source such that by the time you switch on the camera or record that the source is uh, at least uh, have developed that trust in you and believes that you are ready to do what uh, uh, what exactly will help or assist her or him uh, in terms of informing the public and impacting it so uh, for the local leaders at first, I used to be uh, having that uh, fear uh, of doing work, but through experience, as you go on doing it, you reach a certain point where you you no longer fear uh, 
uh, uh, and you can even analyze. You reach a point where you can even is analyze a situation which can become into a tough situation and a situation that is actually, you can easily learn how to differentiate between personal mistakes, uh, individual mistakes and system mistakes. And uh, maybe you can know where to stand considering the state of our nation. Excellent, great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Becca. Um, Tanzim Aziza has a question. Can research scholars join? Uh, I suspect meaning join EGEN. Uh, the answer would be uh, I'm going to let Kindle uh, answer because he's part of the EGEN team. Um, and I'll be handing over to them pretty soon, Kindle and Baker and uh, Ben and Rada, uh, to provide any last thoughts that may, they may have. But before we get to that closing part, uh, shall I just say that there's uh, Leon Pussy, who is very appreciative of your presentation, Madeleine. Uh, je vous remercie vivement, ou uh, vraiment, ma, uh, ma, uh, Madame uh, Madeleine, gave up votre exposé. Great. So I think we only have 10 minutes to go. It's always important for us to have final takeaways, final thoughts. Um, we are appreciative of all your time. We are appreciative of all the questions. I thought this has been a very engaging discussion. Uh, it's moved us forward uh, as a community in Rwanda, but also as uh, a global community. Uh, so, Madeleine, beginning with you, and after that, Baker, I'd like to hear your final thoughts in terms of uh, what you might be taking or what you might want to leave our journalists here with. So let's have a minute and provide maybe just three of those very critical take-home points for you, starting with you, Madeleine. Okay. Um, as some some uh, things that I think we can live with or we can go with at home or working on daily basis and our environmental report. I would say the first thing I think we should take into consideration is to know the challenge, uh, know the environmental challenge. What are some environmental challenge we have as journalists in our country, in, our, in, a, in Africa, for example, and in the world? So as journalists, what are those challenges and how we can tackle those challenges with new, new approach? So uh, where can we find the data? Or is it, uh, do we have data in our local context? Do we have uh, NGOs, do we know NGOs working on the field? Do, do we know how these environmental crimes affect our communities and what our community thinks about this environmental crime. So these are some challenges we should identify and identify also the actors. Uh, apart from knowing the challenge, I think one thing is to acquire new knowledge on how to investigate on environmental topic, going to training, be trained every day, be trained on investigative journalism, on environmental topic. So looking for training as journalists is one thing that will help us uh, working on those topics with uh, innovative approach. And the last thing is, is to be passionate, to try to, to, to go deep into the story. And to go deep into, into the story um, requires a lot, a lot of work from us as journalists. So we should know that working on environmental topic is not something very simple. It's not just about giving uh, opportunity to people to speak. It's about knowing uh, how to, to speak about those topics. It's technical issue. We should learn to work with scientists, to read scientists', scientists reports, to be able to really have a good way of really have um, good information to tell to our public. So know the challenge, uh, go to trainings on environmental topic and uh, try to work in collaboration with scientists try to look or to think as scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Madeleine. You are an important voice on this discussion as we move forward. So please keep it up. May I invite uh, Mr. Samuel Becker of M28 uh, to provide his concluding thoughts, mostly focusing on three things that you might want our journalists here to be able to take home with them. Over to you, Samuel. Yeah, uh, as, as I said earlier, I think uh, journalists should um, consider doing stories that impact their society. 
uh, should consider being uh, an eye for the vulnerables in the country, should consider uh, Actually, when uh, you are journalists and doing uh, a story, I think as a journalist, you have to think that, imagine this is my last story uh, while I'm standing. What impact have I left in my community? What for the benefit of my my society? So we, sh we should stop making uh, our profession uh, uh, in our own benefits. We should consider living others, other people's lives and uh, we should invest much in learning from others, making research before going to do a story, uh, make, keep uh, getting all facts right for the prevention of our outcomes of the story. Uh, because after the story, we have uh, you have to make sure you have uh, your facts right, and you you think about even your security before doing a story. Story after the the story is published and. Uh, I think that would be the best way and that we, that's the only way we can help our society and we can even improve uh, our way of reporting specifically for environmental reporting I think journalists should consider learning much from other journalists because I'm, I'm, I'm aware and uh, that in, in Rwanda we don't have uh, such uh, environmental journalists you can make uh, an eye on, you can learn from. So I think journalists should use other resources on our platforms. You have like uh, the Earth Journalism Networks, we have other resources that are on online tools of investigating uh, wildlife and uh, those environmental crimes. Journalists should consider learning and teaching their selves more than uh, uh, doing uh, uh, stories without uh, well informed and they should even consider to be uh, to specialize if that is the career you are taking just go with that uh, it can help because you will be uh, in the right position uh, to give uh, to give out uh, good information and informative uh, to the public uh, which uh, at least you can't develop you are touching on all angles. So I think uh, good journalism, the environmental journalism network in Canada, even helping them to develop uh, throughout and even themselves should help, uh, should try to help them to develop. Because before someone helps you, you have to help yourself and you have to put more effort to develop. So invest, uh, the, 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 the local network should consider also setting up some trainings, discussion groups, and help themselves to develop as international uh, networks like Earth Journalism and others. Uh, Thank you very much. projects to run help uh, our brothers, uh, mental reporters. Well, thank you so much, Samuel. Uh, we got your point. Uh, I wouldn't go without letting uh, us hear the voice of uh, uh, Tambara uh, Gallion. Uh, he's from uh, uh, Radio Flash FM and Flash TV. And the question is, how do you um, uh, continue to do investigative journalism in a context where the rights of reporters are not protected. Um, Samuel, this is to you. Just in a few words, please, because we are running out of time. You have other 30 seconds to respond to that. Okay, uh, uh, the question, uh, thanks for the question, number. Uh, how can a journalist investigate a story related to the environment in a country where the rights of journalists is not uh, I think uh, investigative journal at every point uh, exposes what is not going on. So, uh, and uh, I don't understand when you talk about uh, that in a country where rights of journalists are not observed. Uh, in our country, we have different levels. We have not achieved good, but at least we have uh, something to show that uh, journalism is not uh, that, that scary. So uh, I think it's, we, we just have uh, to invest uh, in, in the, the, the society wrong and uh, improving the official because of the media. So, help you to even overcome uh, the outcome, if you benefit the outcome of the story. Just have to make all facts right and uh, 
and even have uh, digital security of your content because at a certain point, uh, you know, it's content, your content can be interfered and people can uh, at least uh, use that advantage uh, to challenge you or, or to, 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 to disturb you in your, in your normal, in your, your daily works. So I, I think it's an issue of just taking, getting everything right before you publish a story. Thank you. Appreciate that, uh, Samuel. Um, David. Thank you. Unfortunately, your internet is a little bit uh, wobbly, but that's okay. We could hear the most essential. Uh, that's always a tricky discussion, particularly in countries where uh, freedom of information acts are not available. It's hard for you to get information from government. Then it becomes very uh, challenging, isn't it? So that's uh, understood. Shall I invite uh, Mr. Quindu, uh, Mr. Bannon, uh, for any final words from your end? Uh, we have close to 50 people here. This is a significant part of the uh, uh, journalism community in Rwanda. Uh, we would like, we've started a discussion. It would be important that we continue this uh, engagement. So if there are any thoughts from your end, any critical announcements, uh, any things that you might want to remind reporters before we close, uh, please, let's uh, go over to you. I'll start with Kindu, and then after that, uh, Bernard. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, or it should be the other way around. <laughs> oh, great, yeah. <laughs> let's observe oh, Bernard first, and then Kindu. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, uh, David, and uh, thank you, everyone, for turning up. Uh, this has been a very lively discussion. Um, we would like to really appreciate the Rwanda a network of journalists, uh, which played a very, very critical role in uh, uh, helping us to organize and get everybody to participate in this workshop. Uh, from me, I think the, the take home is that we can do a critical investigative journalism on the environment, uh, not just by doing using the usual tools that we always use for our reporting, sort of the basics, you know, the, doing good interviews, um, uh, making sure we get our facts right, making sure that we, we go and have the voices of the people in the community. But we can also advance it in the ways that um, uh, Madeline has mentioned, that we can use so many different new uh, tools that uh, can enhance our reporting, can enhance the way we visualize information, and, and you know, uh, even allow us to produce stories uh, beyond our own borders as, as, as Rwanda, beyond our own borders as East Africa, and, and you know, so that we, we make a connection with these networks. So um, I think that is a challenge for us that uh, as we live here, it should not be the end of this engagement. Uh, you should try and, you know, we will share with you the, the presentations Please take a look at the resources that Madeline, uh, that Beck and others have mentioned and try to see how you can begin to use them in your day-to-day -day work. Um, and then we'll also continue having a conversation with you. We have your emails now, we have your, uh, your contacts. Uh, so we'll be engaging with you regularly and uh, I look forward to that particularly. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Benon, and thank you so much, uh, David, uh, for this uh, great uh, moderation, and Benon for organizing uh, this workshop, and to our panelists, uh, Samuel, Madeline, and Greg, and our director, James, we really do appreciate uh, the new knowledge uh, that you have um, added to us, and also the motivation and the inspiration. Uh, thank you so much also to our, our panelists. Uh, you've been wonderful, uh, uh, though uh, silent, but uh, you've been participating well in the Q&A. And I've seen someone uh, asking, or David asked me what, how you can join um, the EJN network, uh, which James mentioned is about 13,000 members uh, globally. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll share uh, my screen. I hope you can see that. Can you, Benon? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, so this is the uh, journalism.net uh, uh, website. So if you're new here, uh, you can see from the right hard corner where I'm pointing with my mouse, 
you, you can join uh, the network, uh, which is uh, free. You just click in uh, and then you'll be guided to uh, a few questions. Let me remove these. Uh, join the network. Uh, this just tells you uh, the kind of members we have uh, 9,000, but, but we have 13,000. This needs to be updated. Uh, so you just come and you know, write your uh, personal information it's, and your interest. And it's as easy as that. You'll be subscribed. And also by becoming a member, you'll be getting our monthly uh, newsletters about our work, opportunities, and uh, resources. Uh, uh, that's uh, I'm more like it. I'll take it back to David. And again, thank you so much. I do have a good evening and a wonderful weekend ahead. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Kindu uh, Wawuru. Uh, deeply appreciate it, uh, Mr. Benon Uluka uh, and the entire EJN family. Uh, and thanks for doing this and mobilizing all these journalists for this very important conversation. With that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, apologies for any, uh, anything that did not work well. I take full responsibility. Uh, and thank you so much again for participating. I hope we'll see you soon. Uh, we are all in contact. We all have our contacts. And uh, please do not hesitate if you do want to keep in touch with any of us. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening and see you very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.